So cash abstraction, um, recently it has been very um, popular. We have had certainly a lot of larger enterprises who want to pro protect their coal platforms from uh, increase in online traffic and the expected increase in online traffic, especially in the finance sector, using open banking and also in other related uh, sectors where you're going to have products um, linked with um, banking. Um, so you could have insurance companies looking at uh, your um, payment help or your, your, your finance um, um, certain aspects and of that and then deciding what your premium going to be etc and also looking at uh, what kind of loans can be given to you but what um, banks are doing is obviously they are preparing a lot of APIs to so that people can tap into that and, and create more innovative products to actually kickstart the market now um, from the bank's perspective, it is important that this influx of traffic does not um, create too much um, load on their internal application such that they would be badly affected, especially things like mainframe. If you have uh, too much traffic going into mainframe, the MIPS will go up and the cost of transaction will go up, and then that eats into um, their profit margin uh, so it is all OPEX cost so they have to keep uh, they have to be mindful of their OPEX cost and uh, um, so they are taking such measures and one of the measures is to use cash abstraction at various levels not just presentation level or service layer, layer but they were they're looking at a holistic look at their enterprise architecture where all you could use cash in such a way that it is very less non-intrusive because um, if the data is not in cash, it will go and fetch it from downstream. Once it's fetched, it will be in, in the cash for a period of time until that piece of data is deemed valid and subsequent queries, the results will be taken from the cash. And there are various ways of this being implemented either using a cash aside pattern or using uh, annotations. Um, so Spring frame Framework is quite mature in that and they have um, cacheable annotation on methods which indicate the spring that the result needs to be cached. So which makes development very easy. Um, now Hazelcast already has um, or it's integrated with Spring, and they have Hazelcast Spring um, Java file, which provides you with the framework to do all of this without much of the coding. Um, just configuration, um, which will indicate to Spring to use Hazelcast as the JCache provider or the cache itself. And then um, you use the Spring annotations to um, indicate whether to, to, to cache or not. Now, that is the nutshell of, of what this talk is going to be. We will look at some examples of how this is being implemented and then we can um, interact in terms of uh, um, any other uh, areas which you want to cover. So, um, to go through this topic of cash abstraction, we're going to use Fibonacci series and a routine which is going to compute Fibonacci series because larger numbers is definitely going to take a long time and it will be easier for me to explain that if you cash this, if you repeat that same number or a lesser number, it's going to get you the result quite, uh, quite quickly. So Leonardo de, de Pisa, he allegedly gave the name Fibonacci. I'm pretty sure it came from India before that. Um, so it's basically the, the sum of the two previous digits. So that's, uh, in the interest of time, this bit I'm going to skip because that's not, uh, um, 
sorry. Um, so that, that, that's the, um, the se sequence uh, formula. But um, there's also one um, uh, key thing, that, that when you divide two adjacent uh, Fibonacci numbers, you get the golden ratio. And a lot of things in the world is made with golden ratio. The, so if we have a project with, or an app which computes the Fibonacci, and so in this case, we've given the number 48, the output is, is there, and the duration in milliseconds, that's 28 seconds. So that's a long time. If you were to put 48 again, and if it's going to take another 28 seconds, that's not good for anybody. Uh, and that's um, something which we're going to solve using cache abstraction. We, and if we look at this, if we were to, to just use the plain code, and, and, and do the callers again. It's not, it's, not a, it's not something which anybody's going to be happy about. So herein comes the cache. And what is a cache where we store some objects in, in a place where you can easily access? Now, a um, long time ago, even database was a cache. Now it's in memory. And now, now, you can store the data in memory inside the heap of an application or outside the heap of an application. If you store data inside the heap of an application, the heap cost is going to increase. And if you have larger heap, the garbage collection cycles will be longer. And that means there will be some pauses. There will be more CPU cycles used for that. So. Those, um, there are some disadvantages to that. Storing it outside the heap, you have to, obviously there is a serialization cost, but if you have optimized your serialization, that benefit far outweighs the impact on latency or performance you're going to have with having a very large heap and stop the world pauses. So in terms of uh, like real-time applications, you wouldn't want that. So you would look at storing data outside. But then that also has a drawback, like how much or how far you're going to store these kind of data. So that's, um, that's where Hazelcast comes in, where y you're using distributed nodes, servers to hold data either in memory, uh, uh, in, in ca in, on, either on heap or off heap, but in memory, so that you can have more data uh, distributed across multiple nodes in smaller heaps, so that um, it's the, uh, the application or the server which holds the data is going to perform well. Now, um, if, if we look at it on a, on a, on a the, the the basic explanation, which is to have a copy of the data. Now, if you have a copy of the data, you need to uh, maintain it. It needs to um, it needs to be you need to be able to do CQRs on it. You need to um, have an event source which is going to populate it, or which you're going to process it to update it. So all all of those things comes in. So you need to, there is a way you can use it just simply as a map, or you can have a, an API on top of it, which is going to manage that data for you, from which, and it's got a bit, bit more broader scale on how you access it uh, with predicates or, or, or things like that. So that's, that's a, um, now, if we look at up, keep managing the data, so you have synchronous and asynchronous, or, and that depends on um, whether you want to have 
a very strong consistency with all the areas where the copy of the data lies, or you want to make sure that at least one copy or the master copy is going to be updated in real time, and the rest would be updated eventually. Um, um, and, and both are used. Some use cases, you want to have strong consistency. It needs to be synchronous. Everybody needs to have the same value at all times. Now, um, if you uh, use a, a single application and a database, and you want to just make them both synchronous, so you will have to write the data straight into a database, it's going to take time because the database is not going to work as fast as your in-memory. So the synchronous update doesn't, um, for latency, it doesn't do good. Whereas if you have distributed caches where it can, their piece of data is easily replicated to another server in memory, that's going to have a lot more faster it's going to happen a lot more faster than updating the database. You have two copies. Now, from that second copy or third copy, now you know that even if one node dies, I've got a copy. Now, if you want to update the database asynchronously, it's more healthier because you've got two or three servers having copy of the data. If one or two dies, you still have the data, and you can update the database asynchronously. So that there's, uh, um, it de again, depends on use cases, but the acceptance of asynchronous update into the f disk based or final data store, that is getting more and more acceptable. And also more architecture is coming down where the cache, um, like cache aside pattern, if the data is not in the cache, it's not end of the world because the logic is to use cache to reduce the downstream access. And as long as if the cache is populated in a way that in the near future, that downstream access is going to go down, it's still doing, um, it's, be, it's still being of benefit. So that's uh, like to, Wait, now, obviously, there is a disastrous approach of you know both copies being changed at uh, different times in a way would where that's um, we don't want to go there. As long as, as where there is data, as long as there is only one owner who has the ownership of that data and is the writer of that data, or as a mandate to change that data, it's all fine. But if multiple writers can update it and in a way that is very difficult to keep track of it. I mean, things can go per shape, but we don't want to go there. Now, if you uh, have the have a view that which is your where is your where does your master data live, or was, who is the master copy? Um, um, traditionally. You could say it was memory cache, but a long time ago, it was your database. Whatever, what is in the database is, is what is right. But now it starts changing. What's in the memory is what is, is real and new and updated. What is in the database is just you need to check now with the memory copy. That's, um, it's, it is becoming more acceptable for um, certainly in case of larger enterprise, to have in-memory data fabric and to hold data in memory for a considerable period of time such that that is your working copy and that's where reports get generated from. Um, I'm actually talking about reports where you are doing a lot of data mining if you are holding one, two, three years of data in memory in a lake the level at which you could generate reports, that has now considerably changed. Because in uh, traditionally, if you are generating reports from database, you need to know the schema. You need to know what report you're generating. You can't use any um, 
algorithms to actually determine what is the relationship between data and then say, okay, I'm based on that relationship, I, I just need to lift a, uh, create a report all dynamically where um, from the start of the process, you do not know what report you're going to generate at the end of the process. Those kind of things are now possible because the data access is, is very fast. It's, it's gone to that next level. Whereas if you, the report takes 25 minutes or 15 minutes or five minutes even to be generated, people will not go to that next level because they're not that dynamically generating really standard reports. That's not going to happen in a, in a good time frame um, before that piece of data or that, that insight becomes irrelevant because things have moved on. So that's, um, we will do this code time a bit later because we're just conscious of time. We're gonna, gonna now in, when you do this 50 and you're gonna do the Fibonacci series, now here it's done in zero milliseconds, obviously it's, it's, it's picked the data from a cache. When you run this, when you first calculate technically, it could do the Fibonacci of every number which is below 50 and already put it in the cache. So zero to 50, you put any number, it's going to return instantly. So a lot of smarts like that now can be built behind the scenes where what, during the, uh, uh, the, the process at different points, whatever is the smart data that can be picked out, that they are all cached so that the future computation uh, is improved. So that, that's the demo we're going to have a look at now. And uh, this is again, um, thing. but before I go into the demo itself, I just want to quickly um, uh, tell um, how Hazelcast actually is put together, how Hazelcast uh, distributed in-memory data grid looks like. So Hazelcast distributed in-memory data grid is nothing but a Java process which can communicate to another Java process of the same kind, the Hazelcast server. It will combine with that to become a cluster. It will exchange heartbeat to ensure that they're both alive and any piece of data that is sent to it, it will distribute across to other members in the cluster so that the data is held. Now, because this is a Java process, you can also run process logic or some computation logic on top of it. Then there is two possibilities. Either you have in-memory data grid where you only have whole data and you have um, the predicate and all the APIs which comes with Hazelcast, but it's pure data. No user-defined code is embedded in it. That would be like this. So you have the data grid separate. You can submit tasks to it. You could use it for computation on the data that is already stored in it. You could use messaging topics and queues which are coming from the grid you could then obviously store data and search data. And your applications are using Hazelcast API to do that. So this is a client-server topology. Otherwise, you could embed, your application can embed Hazelcast in it. Hazelcast itself is a, a, it's only less than 100 MB and it doesn't have very many dependencies. So it's a very easy software to embed in any application. The benefit of this is that obviously the, the data and the code, they are co-located, easy access, faster response. Um, but this is difficult to scale because every time you scale, your application has to be horizontally scaled. So if you have any logic which uh, restricts horizontal scaling, then you don't get the benef pure benefit of distributed data grid where you, you can elastically scale easily. 
So that's, these are the two topologies. Um, now, for, for this quick example, we're going to use Spring Boot. We're going to have a method which is going to do Fibonacci. We will first do, uh, look, um, do it without any caching. Then we will introduce caching. Then we will introduce distributed caching. And then we will see how the data is replicated across multiple nodes. Um, so that's what we're going to quickly do. Um, and then we will explain these slides as we go along. So, are you able to see the screen? Are you able to read the stuff? Right. So, I've got a, a, it's actually done by one of our colleagues. So, there is a Spring Boot project. Um, it's got a cache listener, which basically um, prints out when an entry is added. It's the listener factory. There's the controller, which looks at uh, when you have local, uh, the input argument, takes the input argument and calls into the Fibonacci method to, to get, the, uh, get the output. So that's that one. And you get the before and after time and prints out how much time it's going to take to do that. So that's fairly straightforward. You have a map listener because we're going to store these uh, entries in a Hazelcast IMAP, which is a distributed map. And when data is entered into or up, uh, removed, you can, you, can, uh, you can print it out. So we just have an entry added listener for that. And this is the results class, which um, you've previously seen comes on, 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 the, on the browser. So that's the common class. Now, we have one version where you have, where you just simply calculate the Fibonacci, and that's the application. Now, in here, we are not giving any Hazelcast um, dependency in the POM. So Spring doesn't know about Hazelcast. Um, so if I run this, you will see cache manager null. That means it hasn't detected, we haven't configured, there's no dependency. Now, if I've got a postman, which uh, localhost 8080, that's where this is running, and I'm gonna send this. So this takes 45 milliseconds. Now I'm gonna do 34, 17. 35, 35 milliseconds. So there's no caching here. So we need to put caching in without much coding. That's the goal here. So we will look at version one, or no, version two now, where we're gonna make some improvements to this. In here, we have left this fairly untouched, nothing. We have said enable caching, but we still have no Hazelcast. Oh, there, there is Hazelcast, but we haven't put Hazelcast um, spring jar in this. So let's run this and see what happens. So in, in this, it's the internal concurrent hash map that is, the, uh, that is the cache. 
So it's still within the application. The data is not out. It's, uh, it's being held as part of it. Forty-seven milliseconds, one millisecond. So that in theory, it it it, it works. Now we have put cacheable Fibonacci as the annotation to enable that. So Spring reads that, says this results for these has to be stored in the cache. And next time, as long as the argument list is the same. I will return the same result. So that's, that's fine. Now we need to introduce Hazelcast to the equation. So we have the application Spring Boot, enable caching, no change. There's a config class that says give me a new Hazelcast cache manager instance. And there is fairly no change here. Now in the pom.xml, we have put Hazelcast spring support. That is key. Because you, your Hazelcast dependency is just to start a new Hazelcast uh, IMTG server. Hazelcast spring dependence, that is what is required to tell spring that we have to use Hazelcast for caching here. So let's start this. Right, so Let's go through this. It's spring. And you can see it's starting Hazelcast at 5701. Hazelcast has got, and we didn't give Hazelcast any configuration files, so where did all this come from? The Hazelcast dependency has got a default configuration in it. And the Hazelcast hierarchy of picking configuration is that if it will first look if there is an argument list which specifically points to a configuration file. If it is not there, then it will look if there a hazelcast.xml in any of the any of, in the class path. If it is not there, then it will look it will take the hazelcast default uh, configuration which is in the hazelcast.jar which comes with hazelcast dependency. So, which is what it's taken now here. Hence, 5701, which is the default port for the first member. You start another one, it will start at 5702, and then 5703. So, in this case, if you look at, um, so here, there's only one member. So, that's the member list. So the second one starts, this will be a two member list. So, let's quickly see what happens when we send in an argument. So we would use something like, let's say, 37. So 37, the first attempt, takes 258. Now, the reason If we do 37, oh sorry, 37 again, it's just 8 milliseconds. Then a 0. So then you could see 36. It's 48. And then 0. So it hasn't actually... Um, Four. Okay, so it's 23. It's still calculating every num uh, number below the number you've, you've given it. Ideally, it could have just stored 0 to 30, 35. When I give 35, all the Fibonacci's of that. So, but that's uh, 
Um, so how can this be further improved? So what we could do is there could be an external uh, grid running and then you could just do it as a client server mode where the Hazelcast is actually running outside. Now, let me see if I have not stopped this. So now the Hazelcast is running. I have started this management center. Uh, it's fairly easy to start. It comes with, when you download Hazelcast management center, you get this folder and you just double click on it. Or you, when you double click on it, it will start at localhost 8080 and uh, management center, that will be the URL. But you can easily change it, so I've changed it in here. So I'm just going to bring it down so that you can, let me just restart quickly. So I'll just put start management center 8181 Brighton. So that's going to start. What that's going to tell you is, it is going to tell you where are all our Hazelcast server nodes running, what's their IP address, what's the heap cost, uh, what kind of uh, d distributed data structures are being stored? So here, I'm just—it's detected that I've got one node running, which I start just started, and you have uh, this cache being created, Fibonacci. Now, this name, Fibonacci, that came from. There. When you did cat cacheable, it created a cache Fibonacci, and that it stored in Hazelcast. But because it was in Hazelcast, and Hazelcast is publishing all of the statistics to Management Center, Management Center picked those stats and then showed you what is in that cache. Now we're going to quickly look at what exactly got stored in the cache. So there are four entries in there, and you could even look at that entry, so we did, I'm sure we did 34. We browse, oh, no, what we found, so that's, that's not 32. Well, that. I need to look at why it's not, we see 34. Okay, I'll, we'll, we'll look into that. But it tells you when, when there is, uh, how many entries are there. There is no backup um, at the moment, uh, even so. It, it, that's why it's zero. And that's, you can see a, a map config as well of, of that. But this is not strictly uh, correct because it's done by Spring. You you have to provide. You can provide a configuration to override all that. So let's look at that in the next example. So in version four, we are giving a. We're giving a Hazelcast client config. Now, this is basically, this config is saying that this application is going to be a client. This is not going to store data, but it is going to connect to a memory data grid running elsewhere. So we are going to run a data grid. And to run a data grid, um, it is fairly straightforward because it's against Spring Boot and 
the XML is already provided. That's where we're sending the information stance. So that's the POM. The dependencies have been put. So, uh, so now resources. So that's one started. Just going to one more. So you can see um, there are two members now. Now that's the first one, and. Both, both sees each other now. It's automatically increased the port number 5701 and 5702. Now we're going to see, visualize that in the management center. So connecting to the new grid. So these, these are the, the, the two grids. And it basically says those processes, what's the heap used, what's the total heap, all of that information, if you're storing off heap data to tell you that, it will tell you how many major collections happened, what was the cumulative time, how much minor collections happened, what's the cumulative time, what is the partition um, like, it's almost 50-50, so if you actually click on it, on one of them, so you can see, this says number of partitions on 136, and number of partitions on, on this one would be 135 because there's 271 partitions by default and that these partitions are where the data is actually held. So, but we don't, we don't want to go too much into details there because um, that's for another discussion. But we're going to quickly run as a client server mode. So that's the application and we're going to run Client application, it sees that there are two clients. Didn't create a third one because this is a client. Otherwise, this would be three. It's only two here because it connected to the two that are externally running. So now, if you store so say 328 milliseconds, it got the result. Do that again, so it's fairly quick. Now, if you look at the map itself, it did 34 entries there, it's because all of the uh, numbers below 34, it created the Fibonacci and put it in. So that means if we did try 33, it should come very fast. We try 14, it comes very fast. But this, and, and this is client server. The one before that was embedded, what we tried. So um, in this setup, we have not done much coding here. All we have given is we've given, told it, where the client XML file is. The rest, it has all worked it out. The Fibonacci routine, which is the My Service Simple, that's just how you calculate it. So if you have a server running or grid running else, uh, elsewhere in the organization, any project could easily use this for quick caching. Now, a lot of um, 
companies are taking this view that there should be a single team who manages all of the data. And rather than having caches here, there, and everywhere, like there'll be, let's say there are hundreds of projects, and there are thousands of caches managed by hundreds of projects, there'll be then different caching technologies within the bank. They'll usually need resources, different types of resources required. And that all creates complexity. And in terms of auditing, like who holds what data and why, that also becomes difficult. So then there is a, uh, uh, there's a view that have a single team, they provide the caching platform. So Hazelcast becomes the caching platform. And you have various ways to use Hazelcast. For example, like this. And applications would just did not know, does not need to know about the cache, does not need to worry about if the data is getting get lost. That is all the responsibility of the platform because the data is backed up. Your project needs cache, include the library as a dependency, and use the cache. And the cache is available as somewhere in the, in the organization. That way, they have full view of how much data is being stored in memory, any given point of time, who's storing what data is very easy to audit. And with regulations like GDPR and all, where you have to define where are you storing the data, what's, who's using it, then this becomes easier. So organizations who have invested time and effort into it, they are moving into that style of um, architecture and having uh, teams to provide uh, in memory caching platform. Another big advantage of this is that as this platform grows, this then becomes the in memory data fabric. And then you're not then, then you would migrate from using uh, cache abstraction to more uh, direct methods where you're using the cache uh, to actually process the data, change the data, and not just read only where if it's not there, it doesn't matter where, you could use it for more critical functions. So that's a, a, an, uh, an overview of how cache abstraction is currently being used, um, what the industries, what different verticals think that they are going to have more influx of traffic, online traffic, which is going to hit their systems as they have to open up um, how they provide their products and services from traditional means to more digital form. And once that digital form is integrated with other um, um, providers to create a larger package and more innovative pa tailor-made packages for different customers to suit their needs, they would have a lot more traffic coming in and they don't want to and they want to make sure that the cost of those managing those transactions and the cost of um, having to upgrade any or re uh, replace any legacy application, that can be managed because you need an interim phase where you need to put layers in place so that the, your legacy application can cope with it. So cache abstraction definitely you know, uh, has a big part to play in this on how we manage data and get more insight from it. So that's kind of the end of what I wanted to talk about.